As always, it's a great privilege and pleasure to come and open God's Word with you. If you don't know my name, it's Steve, um, and I've been worshipping here a long time. What is the chief end of man? Or using politically correct language, what is the main purpose of humankind? It doesn't have the same ring to it, does it? It's a question from the Westminster Shorter Catechism, published in 1647. For those interested in Protestant history, it's the document of questions and answers written to bring closer conformity between the Church of England and the Church of Scotland. It became a teaching tool for children and new Christians in church doctrine. Question, what is the chief end of man? Answer, the chief end of man is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. To glorify God and to enjoy him forever. I can't think of a better thought with which to start each new day. What's on the agenda today, dear? Let me think to glorify God and enjoy him forever. Let me lead you in prayer. With the words of Arabella Catherine Hankey, tell me the old, old story of, G of, of unseen things above, of Jesus and his glory, of Jesus and his love. Tell me the old, old story. Tell me the old, old story. Tell me the old, old story of Jesus and his love. I like good attention-grabbing openings, especially literary ones. They set the tone for what to expect without revealing how things are going to develop. Last week, Trent drew our attention to the brilliance of Ephesians 1.3. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. From that opening, all the wonder-filled promises of God follow for his children in Christ. When Jane Austen writes, it is a truth universally acknowledged that a single man in possession of a good fortune must be in want of a wife. We're primed for a wonderful comedy of social manners, pride and prejudice lampooned by her subtle wit. When Leo Tolstoy writes, all happy families are the same, but an unhappy family is unhappy in its own way. Everything had gone wrong in the Oblonsky household. We know that things aren't going to end well, particularly for Anna Karenina. When William Shakespeare put into the mouth of Richard, Duke of Gloucester, now is the winter of our discontent, made glorious summer by this son of York. We hope for better days. But we know that dark intrigue lurks in the mind of the man who wanted to become Richard III. When Charles Dickens writes, it was the best of times, it was the worst of times. It was the age of wisdom. It was the age of foolishness. We probably just think he was confused. But we actually think of confusion and that a great social upheaval is in the offing as he tells his tale of two cities. But these classic openings and others pale before Ephesians 1, 3 to 14. In the original Greek, it's one sentence one sentence, 
where Paul piles praise upon praise upon praise to God for what God has, is, and will do for his chosen sons and daughters in Christ. Elizabeth Barrett Browning began a sonnet with How Do I Love Thee? Let me count the ways. See, Paul sweeps along, amazed, overwhelmed almost, as he rehearses all the spiritual blessings God has already poured out in Christ. Not to mention that those that he promises to pour out at the right time in the future. It's majestic, uplifting, empowering and enlivening to read. It's life-changing, reassuring and eternally efficacious to believe, appropriate and experience even now. So how much more when everything is in unity under Christ? Verse 10. Go home. In a little while, go home. Read it again and again. Make it one sentence. Substitute the word and for any full stop you happen to come across. See it build on itself that God in Christ blessed us, chose us, counts us holy and blameless, redeems us, adopts us, forgives us, lavishes his grace upon us. He opens the mystery of his own will to us and is bringing everything into unity under Christ. God did does and is doing this why so that you so that i could respond could respond because no one looks for god before god looked for them so we respond today we do look in detail at verses 11 to 14 the last few clauses of this monumental sentence. We look at how God planned and brought that plan to fruition so that we could respond and accept all that follows and sing praise to God's glory forever. Now, notwithstanding that Ephesians 1, 3 to 14 was read to us perfectly well shortly ago, I will reread verses 11 to 14. fourteen. Because anything I say after it will only be a poor reflection on the majesty, uplift, empowerment, enlivening, and eternal consequence of the very words themselves. So beginning with a conjunction. And in him we were chosen, having been predestined according to the plan of him who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will, in order that we who were the first to put our hope in Christ might be for the praise of his glory. And you also were included in Christ when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, when you believed you were marked in him with a seal, when the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession, to the praise of his glory. Did you hear five wonderful assurances Assurances to grasp for the first time if you are not Christian. To re-grasp in their eternal significance if you are Christian. By the love and grace of God in Christ. Here they are. Chosen, heard, 
believed, seal, guaranteeing. Chosen, heard, believed, seal, guaranteeing. See, Paul continues his monumental sentence at verse 11 by reiterating that we were chosen, that it was God's plan from before creation to do just that. So history is the record, if you like, of how God works out everything to conform with the purpose of his will. Now, firstly, that's a great comfort in a couple of ways. It shows that Christianity, uniquely among world beliefs, has a God-founded purpose, a God-founded direction, and a God-given end. A God-directed a God-founded purpose, a God-directed course, and a God-given end. That's not an end as in termination, but end as in result, as the question, what is the chief end of man? Why are we here? To glorify God and enjoy him forever. Non-Christian beliefs simply lead round in endless circles. Karma, reincarnation, the eternal battle between good and evil as if, uh, as if equal but opposite forces, round and round and round. And you are expected to lift yourself out of the mud by your own bootlaces, or to enrich the charismatic charlatan with your worldly possessions, give dog-like devotion, often to the point of slavery, both a hell of futility and meaninglessness. In Buddhism, supreme personal effort, breaking the circle, might gain you nirvana. But nirvana is not just their word for heaven. It literally means blown out, extinguished, as in a candle flame. <laughs> that was a little bit too loud, sorry. <laughs> when it's gone, there's nothingness, not even the space it appeared to occupy. But to be in Christ is to have a purpose, a direction, a result of glorifying God and enjoying him forever. And all coming from and filled with the grace and love and steadfastness of relationship with Jesus Christ. It also shows that the apparent jumble of the past and the apparent dark, unknowable future aren't that at all. God was, is, and will remain supremely in control. And there is no question over the future of those in Christ. Jesus said, surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. He could have said, surely I am with you always beyond the very end of the age, but that wasn't the context of Matthew 28, 20. Then secondly, it's a comfort because God did this, verse 12, in order that we who were the first to put our hope in Christ might be for the praise of his glory. I've said in sermons, in other sermons, that the main reason God acts is to glorify himself in all things because he alone is worthy to be glorified. But we are apt to think that the we in verses 11 and 12, we are apt to think that Paul means 
himself and his fellow Christians of the time. So that then when Paul gets to verse 13 and writes, and you also were included, he must mean his readers in Ephesus, then us, and other Christians born post-Ephesus. But that's wrong. But don't be too hard on yourselves. I understand from linguists and scriptural commentators that English sometimes lacks some nuances of ancient Greek. For example, English has largely has one word for love, whereas Greek has different words for different types of love. Brotherly love, sexual love, familial love. Anyway, through Ephesians 1, 3 to 14, Paul has been using words steeped in Old Testament imagery. Trent referred to this last week. Old Testament imagery that demonstrate the relationship of God to Israel and Israel to God. Trent spoke about the privilege of adoption into sonship. He spoke about redemption, which always comes at the price of blood, as in the sacrificial system. Genesis 22.8 speaks of God's blessing to all nations through Abraham's descendants. Genesis 28.14 says the same thing about Jacob. Deuteronomy 4.20 shows Israel to be God's people of his inheritance. And we know that inheritance is 99 times out of 100 waiting for something in the future. Zechariah 2.12 says Israel is God's portion. That is something personal to him that he intends to love and keep, lead and protect through to the time that he fully becomes their inheritance. When all things are in unity under Christ, an inheritance that the Jews experienced in part and that Christians also experience now in part, but that will be fully inherited by all believers at God's appointed time. Paul is using these Old Testament images to reinforce the direction and progress of God's plan throughout history. First for the Jews, then for the Gentiles, he says in other letters. So here, in Ephesians, he is saying that because Jews first put their hope in the Christ, the promised Messiah because they knew about and hoped for the coming of the suffering servant, read Isaiah. They understood that redemption, forgiveness and salvation is sourced from and is the gift of God alone. And God is to be praised for it. So in verse 12, Paul is identifying with his Jewish heritage and all the privileges God bestowed on Israel because he loved them. Then, verse 13, and you also were included. Now he's gotten to the Gentiles. And by God's loving grace to us, we also were included in Christ. How wonderful is that? How unexpected. How amazed and yet thankful must the first century Gentile hearers have been when they heard that message because to many Jews of the time, the Gentiles were just fuel for hell's fires. How wonderful, how and perhaps how unexpected as well when the mystery was opened to us, verse 9, for the first time. So that we could hear and understand and share in God's will 
according to his good pleasure. His good pleasure. See, God enjoys bringing Gentiles back into relationship. He enjoys showing the Jews that their belief, their faith, their life had a purpose, a direction, a result. Because everything is purposed in Christ. Again, verse 9. So this allows, it even necessitates loving relationships and fellowship between all brothers and sisters in Christ, which has been very much a theme of the last few months of Trent's preaching. And it's ongoing for now because God's times, verse 10, have yet to reach their fulfilment. Yet another reason for praise. Because that future fulfilment has enabled you and me to be part of God's plan. To be in unity with all things in heaven and on earth under Christ. Verse 10. Unity with those of the past and with those of the future. And particularly with those of the present. Praise God. And never stop praying for those who burden our hearts in the here and now. While there is still time. Then in verses 13 and 14, tucked away at the end of Paul's sentence of praise upon praise of wonder upon wonder from verse 3 are my five assurances included in Christ or chosen. Different word. But if we're included, then we're already chosen. And if we're already chosen, then we're automatically included. When we heard the truth about our available salvation in Christ as the only way, the message of love, mercy, forgiveness and relationship. Then, because we recognise the gospel message as the truth, by God's grace, we believed So at the very, that very time, at this very same time, the Holy Spirit took up residence in our hearts and seals this new and unbreakable relationship between believer and saviour. At that very same time. It's a chamber that Trent has, uh, went to St. Clair this morning because I then had, we're talking... Coincident aorist particle, par, uh, participles. Coincident aorist participles. And if you want to know what that means, ask Trent. At the very same time, no time lag, no having to wait, or worse, earn the indwelling Holy Spirit. Literally, the, in the Greek, the Holy Spirit of promise. Which can mean either the Holy Spirit that Jesus promised would come after his ascension back to the Father, post-resurrection, Acts 1.5, or the Holy Spirit that fulfills and guarantees that the believer will inherit, experience, and enjoy forever and ever all of God's promises to his sons and daughters by adoption in Christ. It's sublime in its beauty, unsurpassable in its grace, to the never-ending praise of God's glory, guaranteeing, ensuring, fixing in stone, truly, written in blood, Jesus' blood. The 
Holy Spirit indwelling him, himself, indwelling the believer, is the deposit from God guaranteeing because it's God who is our inheritance. Eternal life with God in Christ is what God promises. And it's both what we enjoy now, albeit partly, and will enjoy fully in heaven. One commentator wrote, Christians' experience of spirit is, it now is a foretaste, a pledge of what will be theirs when they fully possess their God-given inheritance. Paul told the Corinthian Christians that God set his seal of ownership on us and put his spirit in our hearts as a deposit guaranteeing what is to come. While he told the Romans that the Holy Spirit is the first fruit of future fulfilment. Chosen, heard, believed, seal, guaranteeing. That was God's process with us. Christian brothers and sisters, remember it. Meditate on it. Speak about it with all praise to God's glory. In fact, Ephesians 1, 3 to 14, is worth memorising. After all, it's only one sentence. I haven't memorised it. But I have memorised Psalm 23, which covers the same wonderful thoughts, albeit from an Old Testament perspective. Remember, Paul said, we Jews who were first to put our hope in the Christ. So David wrote, Surely God's goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. So if you don't want to memorise Ephesians 1, 3 to 14, at least memorise chosen, heard, Believed, sealed, guaranteed, and Psalm 23. Chosen, included, stand in awe of God's power and mercy in knowing us by name and choosing us before the creation of the world. Heard, thank God for his mercy in calling and sending others in Christ to deliver the gospel message to us. Believed. Praise God for his free gift of faith that in Christ we stand cleansed and are counted blameless before the throne of God's mercy. Sealed. Yes, I've changed the tense. Sealed. Be assured that by the indwelling spirit we have an unbreakable relationship with God in Christ. Guaranteed. Surely, God's goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen.